neuroscientists have been studying transgender people's brains for for quite a while now, maybe 20 years. Um, and again, there were some splashy early studies that suggested that this tiny little zone of the hypothalamus or a structure called the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis um, differed in uh, transgender versus uh, cisgender people. However, um, there's now been about 20 studies, I think, of transgender people's brains and comparing them to cisgender. And by and large, um, because there's very little gender difference to begin with or sex difference, the differences are subtle. And, and again, they're all over the map with different studies finding different phenomena in male to female, female to male, and then apparently um, one sexual uh, orientation also influences. So remember, gender and sexual orientation are completely different dimensions. You can be uh, you can be cisgender and be gay or straight. You can be transgender and be gay or straight for the gender that you identify with. And um, so uh, we see, depending on the study, subtle differences um, in all these groups. Very little replication from study to study. In the last decent review, or the only decent review of this literature, I've, I've been reviewing it myself, but I haven't published it, but there's one published review in 2015. The basic conclusion from this was, we just need to abandon the idea of binary brain sex, period. That the studies of transgender individuals do not support the idea that there is such a thing as a male brain in a female body and vice versa. To me, um, gender is a spectrum. I, 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 you know, there's no question there is such a thing as masculinity and femininity and that, you know, more uh, X, X individuals are feminine and more XY are masculine, but it really is a spectrum and you can find any individual anywhere on the spectrum or some people even refer to it as a mosaic, that there are these dimensions of masculinity and femininity. I, mean, I talk about gender identity and sexual orientation, which can be quite different, but you know, we also have things like uh, uh, aggressiveness, uh, physicality, social sensitivity. I mean, we could we could chalk up um, all kinds of things that we all know, what's the masculine end, what's the feminine end on the spectrum. And you can find individuals that are a mosaic of those different things, you know. So you can find somebody, I mean, I, I, I consider myself very much of a mosaic brain. I've always been a strong in math and science and I'm pretty, pretty physical athletic. But, you know, uh, get me around a baby. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote my first book on babies. I'd like to think I'm very nurturing and socially sensitive. And so I, I think I'd end up on the feminine side of the spectrum in, 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 in that zone. And so for each of us, um, there are many, many dimensions of masculinity and femininity. Cult, you know, cultural stereotypes have portrayed it as if it's this binary but um, our brains have to do all of these things. And so our brains have many, many circuits that for any individual are going to fall uh, towards the male, masculine, towards the feminine, or maybe kind of in between. Um, so I, we just really need to abandon this idea of binary brain sex. And that applies equally for cisgender as for transgender people. Right. Well, it's just it's really fascinating that um, gender identity is not really tied to anything that we can um it's not really tied to brain structure right just like we have discussed so it, it, again i think it leaves it leaves us all in a space of maybe unknowing just, sorry mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah j just unknowing of not exactly fully understanding ourselves very well and understanding how there is such uh, large variations in human beings and our identities and what we identify ourselves as regarding gender and uh, yeah. you can't just reduce it to something biological yeah no i mean by the same token you know we don't know the neural circuitry for being a republican or a democrat <laughs> we don't know the neural circuit for being a, a christian versus a non-believer you know we know that there are there are brain activation differences uh in people with different groups but you know we're barely if the if the task is very discreet 
if it's like reading words or, like I said, identifying facial expression, neuroscientists can map out the circuits for these things. But how do you map out a circuit for gender identity? I mean, what is gender identity? How do you put somebody in a scanner and um, activate their sense of gender identity? There, It's just it's not uh, an atomic brain activity and it's and so I think like any of our complex thought processes it evolves through life (laughs) you know our our ability to identify our tendency to identify um, is going to be influenced by many factors genetic and environmental and interestingly one thing about transgenderism which I guess kind of surprised me because I think the dogma is that you have a child born with the wrong brain for their body or vice versa. But it turns out that people transition at all ages and they don't necessarily, they weren't necessarily um, dysphoric, gender dysphoric as children. It can come on at many stages of life, um, which again tells me it's, um, it's a, it's, it's, it's influenced by life experience and culture and, and uh, a lot of complex Im- influences, um, and and frankly, we can't study it in animals either because gender is by definition cultural, and animals maybe have a, a little bit of culture, but I would yeah. argue not to the extent that we do. Right, it doesn't get they're not as uh, maybe it's not as complex. Self aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just think this is a incredibly fascinating subject because I. I don't know. I, I want people to be respected and I want to respect everybody's decisions in their life. I do have some, understandably, I, I think there is some, and I, I don't know if you have an opinion on this particular element of it, but you describe people who identify as one gender or the other. They might, th- this comes up in different parts of their life, which indicates that it might be cultural um, in its origin or, or something like that. But I think that because people are want to be so inclusive um, of transgender people, like for instance, if you have a child that's about maybe six or seven years old, and they say it's a little boy physically, uh, biologically a boy, but they say I want to dress and be like my sister or like a girl, and that parent may then think, oh well, they're just a transgender who wants to transition into to female. I, I've heard of these cases where uh, children mm-hmm. are are basically under co hormone therapy. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's the territory that I, I know it's a bit, it gets into a, a really politically sensitive, very difficult territory to discuss because in no way am I trying to be insensitive or trying to dismiss or say that people can, you know, do whatever they want with themselves and, and, and identify whatever they, uh, whatever they want uh, regarding their gender. Um, but I, I think we get into this territory of trying to understand how to deal with, say, children who are undergoing this process. Um, I, I just, I, again, I don't know if you have an opinion on that, but that's really where my my confusion or interest uh, uh, kind of goes into because it, it it really concerns me when people maybe don't have a nuanced perspective or, or letting that child grow up and see how it all plays out, I guess, is maybe the way I would say that. Yeah, it's extremely difficult time um, in for like pediatric psychiatry and, and endocrinology um, trying to understand what to do with kids who are gender dysphoric that who express, you know, that they're not they they want to be uh, the gender other than their bio, uh, gonads. But um, I. I and it's evolving. Um, the good news is there are protocols in place for a child who is, is you know, very persistent, very insistent uh, about their um, gender dysphoria that they, you know, a, a genetic boy who says, you know, I am a girl, I want to be a girl, I've always wanted to be a girl. There are protocols in place that involve delaying puberty and waiting till the child is at the age of consent, or I think maybe at 16 now, 
in allowing them to choose to initiate hormone therapy and so on. But generally a very slow, the, the advice is to take it very slow because some kids do change their mind. Uh, uh, and so many social factors can, can influence that and, and complex psychological factors we really don't understand. Um, right. But I can tell you that it's a, extremely challenging for parents and, and pediatricians these days um, we want to be affirming. We don't want to um, shame children. And that was always the standard uh, method for trying to condition children to accept their um, biological gender. And a lot of kids were seriously traumatized by that. So I think we're in a better space that way in terms of parents and hopefully teachers and communities affirming uh, children's Gender creativity. I like that term better than gender dysphoria. Kids are being creative about <laughs> gender. Right. Um, but, but you know, those are these are major changes to your body that may affect your fertility, uh, may affect your various aspects of your health. And so we need to be extremely cautious and and take it slow uh, for how uh, children are treated medically. And, you know, stay tuned is all I can say that yeah, maybe in yeah. another 10 or 20 years, we'll have this sorted out better. But I, one maybe final thought is that, you know, none of this would be an issue if, if we did not have binary gender, if we all <laughs> dress the same, if we didn't have different pronouns and different names, and if we didn't line up the boys and girls separately or send them to different bathrooms, if, Kids' sports, frankly, frankly, could be gender integrated until puberty. There's there's no difference in strength or ability between boys and girls before puberty. There's no reason to separate the soccer teams. We just make such a big damn deal about gender yes. that we force kids to pick a team. You know, mm -hmm. if gender truly is a spectrum and yet we only present them two teams, well, what do we do with all those kids that are kind of in the middle? Right. Um, and that may be a lot of kids, you know, that are not super masculine or not super feminine. And, and, and we force them into these narrow boxes that really constrain the rest of their lives. It constrains the kinds of things they're going to practice. It constrains who they interact with, who they befriend, who, who they talk to, who they get close to. Uh, and, you know, to me, you know, gender is very limiting. So the ultimate solution to this would be if we could live in a truly, not gender neutral society, but gender free society, where it just wasn't a label that influenced anything in our lives. And and then we wouldn't have kids, I, or people, I think, as much wanting to uh, change their outward anatomy. Mm -hmm.